Bonjour, Mary. Bonjour, Lorraine. Bienvenue à Paris. And by that, I mean welcome to Paris. <laughs> How was the train? Invigorating. The French countryside was so beautiful, and I'm looking forward to spending the next nine weeks in Paris. So glad you made it safely. And if you'll follow me, I'll take you to meet Alice Bead. She wants to share a story about the master. Oh, great. Let's go. Look, Lorraine. You can see the Eiffel Tower on my left. And it's the Louvre up ahead. Oh, and there's Alice. After a morning talk given by Abdul Baha, all those present were invited to meet him at four o'clock at a place where a real Baha'i settlement work is carried on by Monsieur Ponsonnet and his good wife. They are poor people. Having received the message, he felt his work for the cause of God was among the very poor children, the waifs, and those who had no parents. So, with his wife, some years ago, settled his home here, and by going without their noon meal, which to the French means much, they could give it to these little ones. They started at an old car, where they met together to read the tablets and hear the word of Baha'u'llah. It was not long before many came, and it grew so that the clergy of many sects desired to have it consolidated under them. Monsieur Ponsonnet declined all these offers. At last, the clergy grew so very jealous that they took the car away from him. The Baha'i friends in Paris offered to build a place for his work, and Monsieur Poussinet told them, if they would furnish the boards and nails, that he would build it himself, which he did. And it was here that we went. And after three months spent going around Paris every day, I assure you I had never seen such a dirty, miserable quarter. We walked down to the end of a narrow lane where soldiers and women were drinking and screaming while from the small windows bedclothes were hanging out and women and children could be seen. It was with joy we at last saw a familiar face and Monsieur de Scott pointed us to a small board cabin, about 20 by 25 feet, with a raised platform and desk of rough boards. My eyes fell first upon the greatest name and then I saw the crowd of miserably poor dear little ones gathered there and as my ears caught the music of their voices, for they were singing, tears filled my eyes, and a great lump choked me. It was Madame Ponsonnet who evidently had taught the children to sing. After the song, Monsieur Ponsonnet read a tablet sent by the master. They sang again, and then all their little heads turned towards the entrance, and it was evident that their hearts were full of expectancy, and they longed to see the one who had promised to visit them. At last, there was silence. Then, all arose to their feet as Abdu Baha quickly entered and walked up the narrow center passage to the front and stood. He said, I am very glad to be here with you. I am very glad to see you all here. I love you very much. I have been in many beautiful houses, but this is more beautiful to me than any of the others. For the spirit of the love of Baha'u'llah is here. You are all receiving the teachings of God and learning how to act and live, and someday you will be great and wise for having learned the truth. I have seen many beautiful, rich children, but to me you are more beautiful, and I love you all, as Christ loved little children here. Monsieur and Madame Ponsonnet are your spiritual teachers. They give you food and understanding eternal of God. You must love these good friends. And turning to Monsieur and Madame Ponsonnet, he said, This is a great work you are doing for the love of God in this great day, through the power of Baha'u'llah. Your station is great. Your names will go down through all the ages. Kings and queens have never been talked of and remembered as you will be. You are workers in the kingdom of Abha, and I am very happy and love you very much. Then, 
with his head upturned and the palms of his hands upturned together, he chanted a prayer and blessing, and coming down from the small elevation to where the children were, all crowded close to him, and laying his hands caressingly upon some of their heads, and taking the hands of others with a loving smile to all, with difficulty, he passed down the aisle to the door. So ended a never-to-be-forgotten day, having seen Abdu'l-Bahá among the children of the poor of the streets of Paris, and I thought again of the light I saw twice on Fridays in Akka, and wondered if they were missing him and longing for his return and loving help. The thought comes to me now of what the world's poverty will be after his departure, and to us who have been fed from his hand on the bread of life. You're listening to the Journey West podcast, dedicated to following the travels of Abdu'l-Bahá in the West. The master spent nine weeks in Paris. His accommodations were arranged by Monsieur and Madame Dreyfus Barney. The apartment in which he stayed was situated in the Avenue des Camons and had a drawing room which could accommodate between 75 and 100 people. It was in this drawing room that the master held the majority of his meetings in Paris. Jenna will now read one of his addresses. Talk on October 18, 1911. The power and value of true thought depend upon its manifestation in action. The reality of man is his thought, not his material body. The thought force and the animal force are partners. Although man is part of the animal creation, he possesses a power of thought superior to all other created beings. If a man's thought is constantly aspiring towards heavenly subjects, then does he become saintly. If, on the other hand, his thought does not soar, but is directed downwards to center itself upon the things of this world, he grows more and more material until he arrives at a state little better than that of a mere animal. Thoughts may be divided into two classes. First, thought that belongs to the world of thought alone. Second, thought that expresses itself in action. Some men and women glory in their exalted thoughts. But if these thoughts never reach the plane of action, they remain useless. The power of thought is dependent on its manifestation in deeds. A philosopher's thought may, however, in the world of progress and evolution, translate itself into the actions of other people, even when they themselves are unable or unwilling to show forth their grand ideals in their own lives. To this class, the majority of philosophers belong, their teachings being high above their actions. This is the difference between philosophers who are spiritual teachers and those who are mere philosophers. The spiritual teacher is the first to follow his own teaching. He brings down into the world of action his spiritual conceptions and ideals. His divine thoughts are made manifest to the world. His thought is himself, from which he is inseparable. When we find a philosopher emphasizing the importance of grandeur and justice, and then encouraging a rapacious monarch in his oppression and tyranny, we quickly realize that he belongs to the first class, for he thinks heavenly thoughts and does not practice the corresponding heavenly virtues. This state is impossible with spiritual philosophers, for they ever express their high and noble thoughts in actions. The idea of taking thoughts and turning them into actions is timeless in its relevance. In a hidden word by Baha'u'llah, he says, O son of my handmaid, 
guidance hath ever been given by words, and now it is given by deeds. Everyone must show forth deeds that are pure and holy, for words are the property of all alike, whereas such deeds as these belong only to our loved ones. Strive then with heart and soul to distinguish yourselves by your deeds. In this wise we counsel you in this holy and resplendent tablet. Similarly, in a recent message from the Universal House of Justice, dated December 28, 2010, Baha'is all over the world are asked to take action in helping to transform their communities. We are now joined by Hannah, Mitch, and Rajana in their roundtable discussion of these ideas. Hi, my name is Rajana, and I'm a public relations and hospitality professional. Hi, I'm Hannah, and I'm an environmental studies major. I'm Mitch, and I'm a carpenter. I think I oftentimes heard just the first part, the reality of man is his thought, and never the second part of this particular uh, statement, which is the reality of man is his thought, not his material body. And in a way, it, it, it does help you understand the whole concept a bit better when it's put into perspective that it's not the body and we're back to mind over matter. And this can be applied in such a wide range of circumstances. Either it has to do with um, you know, your internal locus of control and how if your thoughts are what you're in control of, which you are, um, then that in a way defines what your body would be doing, how you would be feeling, and, well, how you would be using your own mm -hmm. self will be defined by your thought, not by what your body dictates that you want to do and can do. Um, and that pushes into the background a lot of the old world justification of why people do things. Oh, because it's our nature, because this is the way men or women were created, um, hormones, um, brain, and so on and so on. It, clearly that says that it is not so. It is your thoughts that dictate your reality and not whether or not you have legs or, you know. Well, the thought force and the animal force are partners, but what is the relationship between those two things? You know, a lot of people, they use their animal force, regulates their thought, but really it's only our animal our animal self is only to bring our thought around the world, really. You know, our body, what's the purpose there? Our reality is our thought. So as we move around, our body, its only purpose, really, you know, is to move our thought. What, is it our animal self that, when taking control of our thought, uh, directs it downwards into itself and centers on the self? Or is it our thought in itself that can choose or you know we choose which way our thoughts go i wonder they are co they are connected from what i understand reading this that they're unless i'm not misunderstanding your question but the thought force and the animal force are partners so if you know we find let you know say blank slate you know we don't we have, we have no experiences to go off of but then we have an experience which is very pleasing to us physically, um, maybe, or maybe it's just being really lax, like just not doing anything. We find like this is really enjoyable. <laughs> you know, like I don't have to get tired. I don't know. You know, um, that affects our thoughts because then all of a sudden we've had an action that feeds back into our memory, which we then refer to. And perhaps the next time that uh, opportunity to do that action that is so pleasing to our bodies mm -hmm. comes up again, we're more inclined to do that. And then, you know, if you keep having a pattern of experiences, that's going to be influencing your thought. But then, as we as we know, though, that, the, um, that we have a power of thought that is also superior to just, you know, mm. pleasing our physical desires. So we have to start disciplining ourselves against just indulging a more physical existence. 
it's such a big question of how do our how does reading this article affect our thoughts and our actions and like the relationship between the two. I feel like before answering that big question, I have to like break it down to even understand what are my thoughts, what are my actions, and how are they how are they influenced by each other. So. I think that's why earlier when we were asking those questions of like, well, what are our thoughts and what is the scale of action that counts as expressing thoughts in action? This process of having an experience and that, you know, whatever pleasurable experience it was, reinforcing your further desire to have that experience again it is a classical pavlov experiment where you know he rings the bell he gives the dog some food the dog's happy and then it salivates when it hears the bell without even the food so it's like classical conditioning which was proven to be a behavior modification system that works for people and mm -hmm. animals mm -hmm. but it responds to our animal force mm -hmm. It's, it's very simple, it's very direct, and can be, well, either used to help or misused. But that indication that the power of our thought is superior to the animal instincts, I think this, it's a key point in what we're being told here. And I feel this is the part where we move into the acknowledgement of the right and the wrong, mm -hmm. that humans distinctly have that I understand animals don't. Animals act according to their instincts. Some are very high mm -hmm. instincts, some are very, very basic. But, you know, the, as far as we know, there's no thought process that happens in the animal world in terms of is this right or is this wrong? Mm -hmm. And now humans have that power and potential to distinguish between the right and the wrong. And this is, you know, where we move into the question of how do we know what is right and what is wrong and where that knowledge comes from. <clears throat> well, I think as, as humans we have this, you know, a dog will never go up to another dog and tell him, hey, that's really good, you should do that, you know? Go chase that rabbit, it's really fun, you know? <laughs> but a human will tell another human to do something you know, but a, a plant will never tell another plant <laughs> to grow because it's it's a really amazing thing to do. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> so that's why we have we have these these kind of these two teachers in the world. There's those that they're telling us to do something and they don't actually do it themselves. You know, so it's like a dog telling the one dog to chase the rabbit, but he's just sitting there and he's not chasing the rabbit. Maybe it's a bad example, <laughs> but. A human can tell another human to do something, as I've already said. So, but one human, you know, can tell somebody to do something, and they don't do it themselves. But another human can tell them to do that, and leading by example can prove that the idea is actually beneficial to that other. Yeah. I feel like the defining factor is, do we carry our exalted thought through and make it a reality, make it an action? Um, only then can whatever inspiration we have benefit the world and help others inspire them to either accompany you or do even better. Um, otherwise, it's it, it, thought is, I'd link it to a talent that you have, but you never actualized into anything, either to enjoy for yourself or for the others, and you just keep it all to yourself glorying in the knowledge that you're a good writer or a good knitter, but you've never made a scarf for your grandma. And it's of no avail to anyone. So is it a moral obligation when you have an exalted thought to manifest it into action and to share that with others? Yeah. That's what he says. Because they remain useless. The, th the, th the thoughts that are not expressed in action, they remain useless. They are theory. You mentioned in the beginning sort of how our bodies are vehicles for which we can pass our thoughts along. And if we don't put our thoughts into action, how will things progress forward? How will we advance in some ways? Because you can 
talk about your ideas, but until something's actually done with those ideas, you know, like in physical, it's funny, like in some ways it links back to how we are connected to our physical world because until we actually use our our body, our spiritual thoughts, however um, exalted they may be, if they can't affect the hearts of other people, from what I understand, then it, it, there's just there's not a va- there's no value to it in quite the same way. Well, I think as a musician, I find it really interesting because we have in the Baha'i writings a lot of talk and speech given to us by Baha'u'llah and Abdu Baha about music and how it is a ladder for the soul. But I don't think any musician, any Baha'i musician, can say today that Baha'i music exists. So we have these thoughts of what Baha'i music might be like and what it will look like in the future. And as a musician, we can constantly try to bring these, these ideals into, into our music. But none of us really have the form yet. We only have the spirit behind it. So we're constantly trying to do that. I find uh, as a Baha'i or um, maybe just as a, an individual, it's always an uphill climb um, translating exalted thoughts and um, exalted teachings of the faith into actions in a in an environment and under circumstances which are often not um, supportive or conducive to changing the old ways, the old patterns of life. Um, I've worked in the public relations industry for a number of years and I hope to continue doing so. Um, but um, and it's one of the industries that is infamous for twisting the truth and translating um, the fact that truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues and remaining true to your own, in a way, ideals and doing the job correctly and getting the results while you know keeping truthfulness in front of you is... It is possible, and uh, it will. It's extra effort. It's staying overtime at work. It's doing more research, and it didn't sometimes mean um, telling customers or the companies that you would work with that something is not to be done in a certain way, and. Um, I think only when you keep that ideal in front of you would change slowly affect because there are people out there in every industry that want um, a more ideal way of doing things. But um, we are given the courage by those words that uh, the, the reality is the thought, not the f- fear or... Um, your animalistic instincts to earn as much money as you can. Um, it's empowering, but it's difficult. I think on a basic level, um, to take thought and express into action, I think about, I mean, in a sense, what the reason I decided to study the environment was because I had thoughts or, you know, feelings about, uh, strong feelings about nature and wanting to not necessarily preserve nature as it is, but not do harm um, to ecosystems and, um, and, and the resources that we rely on. And so in that sense... I mean, it's sort of a big picture thing, I guess, but that's the action I took on a thought. I suppose this is where we, as humanity, get our notion of right and wrong from. Um, when we look at the philosophers of humankind, uh, we see those by whose work, um, and you can see if the tree is useful by its fruit, if it bears fruit. And uh, there were many, a man and a woman, who said very beautiful things, but those who um, adhered to the things that they said um, and were welcomed and uh, gained followers and 
you know, it grew, it grew, it grew. Um, we see that happen with all the world's major religions. Um, and the followers would in turn bring their fruit to the betterment of humanity and contribute, while those who spoke beautifully but were not reflecting their, their ideals in their own lives were eventually shunned as two-faced. Uh, when I think about the teachers I've had that have inspired or encouraged me the most and I've felt the most proud of the work I've produced for those classes, I think they emulate the you know, qualities of so, you know, spiritual teachers. Um, they're often people who work in the field in which they're studying or they have experiences that they've taken us as students on with them. And their perspective, because of their experiences, just has so much more validity versus teachers who can't, or who, for whatever reason, don't bring the material and apply it to our lives. I mean, even back to like high school, like I think about um, like math teachers. <laughs> I don't know, um, math teachers who, when they can really show you w what it means and why it's important to know math or something, that and I actually felt inspired to really learn it and um, do better at it versus um, those who could talk but you couldn't see the, see the connection necessarily. So there's those people that they not only give us the lesson, you know, the teaching, they carry it out in their own lives and show us why it's a beneficial thing. I mean, teachers, you know, it's a perfect example, mm. but I think also parents, you know. Mm. My father would always tell me to turn the TV volume down and then listen to it so loud it shook the whole house. <laughs> and I would say, you know, if my dad can listen to it so loud, why can't I? So as parents, you know, trying to find... So if your parent is showing you something, mm -hmm. telling you to do something, and they mm -hmm. themselves aren't manifesting mm. that teaching, yeah. you know, the same way as a spiritual philosopher, Definitely. you're not, you're not going to want to listen. Yes, agreed. What better example of uh, a person translating um, sp high spiritual ideas into his life um, than Abdu'l-Baha, um, while, you know, kept a prisoner of um, the Ottoman Empire, um, a regular man would become so bitter um, and just, you know, having had to, to having to face challenges throughout you know, his childhood into his youth, into his adulthood and late age, um, he would still manifest so much love towards the people who would um, try to cheat him out of his money or um, treat his family unkindly, uh, anything. Um, he would deal with so much grace and loving kindness and understanding that he would transform the hearts of others and um, have those people respect the teachings of his father. Um, and that that's our perfect exemplar. It's who we would aspire to. Um, as, a, as a real person, a real man, with lots of challenges throughout his life, and still so loving that he would conquer the hearts of people who would see him for the first time. All right, that concludes our segment this week. Thanks for joining us. We hope you'll check out our feature page where we are sharing stories of what you all are sending in. And don't forget to email us your stories to info at thejourneywest.org. See you next time. Bye.